Greetings tapeworms! In this video I am going to present my first impressions and a teardown of the Tascam 238 Synca set. This is the first of these that I've seen in the wild and um, I figure that I've just got myself an achievement because I think this is the last 4 track or 8 track made by Tascam that I have not actually repaired and recorded with before. I've still to cover the 644 on the channel though I have in fact worked on those a couple of times but apart from that if we ignore the rack mount stereo stuff and digital stuff um, I have now completed Tascam or will have completed Tascam by the time I get this working again. Uh, so I've just noticed that we're slightly out of focus here, um, excuse my bad cameramanship, but what I will do is have a look at the different features, I'll take it apart completely, there is an issue with this unit where track 8, much quieter than the others, the original seller said that they already tried swapping the record playback boards. Therefore, they think it's something to do with tape alignment. We'll find out if that is the case or not. The person that bought that, who is sending it to me, which is Adrian from We Happy View Music, thought that there was a little bit of speed change in the main capstan motor when it's first turned on. And this is despite the previous owner saying that they recapped driver for the capstan motor, which is apparently a common problem. So there will be a bit of repair work going on. We will be looking at schematics. Yeah, so if you're curious about this unit, you need to do any repair or servicing of it, then I hope that what we're going to be doing will be helpful. I'll run the intro just now, and when we come back, I'll start looking at features, and uh, we'll turn this unit on for the first time. <laughs> So here's my reaction to this, not knowing that much about it other than it exists and I have wanted to look at one for quite a while. A jig button, power button, tape speed, fixed, variable or EXT, so external. So there's going to be some sort of synchronization option for this. That's the area of multi-track cassette recorders that I know least about because I'm least interested in it because half the beauty of these things to me is that we can get away from the computer. So syncing it to a computer just doesn't really come up on my radar, but uh, we'll explore that later. Um, and the fixed speed then, I assume this is going to be three and three quarter inches per second. 9.5 centimeters per second. Um, if we move this switch to this position, then we can add maybe plus or minus 10, 15%. We will go over to the user manual in a bit and to establish that. And I guess here, the motor speed is changing to make sure that one of the eight tracks strike with some sort of time code is synced up with, I don't know, FSK, MIDI, SMPTE. Uh, that's for us to find out when we look at the rear panel and we look at the user manual. We have pause, play, record, stop, fast forward, rewind, little tactile switches in there are going to be running. I think I know that this is a three motor unit and also there will be assist or control motor, whatever you call it, that's raising and lowering the heads, a real motor that's turning either the supply or take up reel in a rewind or fast forward and play mode. And then the capstan motor is, would I say direct drive? I don't think there's a capstan belt in this. I believe having seen gut shots and so on of other pupils, the electromagnet is actually set into the flywheel. So that should mean it's actually a bit more stable than other Tascam 8 tracks like the 688 or the 488 and 488 Mark II in terms of wear and flutter. Over here we've got a counter and a memory, but we've got reset TRT. I should know what that is. We'll come back to that. Uh, return to zero, check. We've got two memory locations and two other locations. But it looks like we've got rehearsal auto punch in and out facilities, which are to do with these locations. So we can set punch in and punch out very accurately. We have DBX noise reduction. And it looks like we can defeat that in two groups, groups one through four and five through eight. I'm a little surprised that there isn't an option to turn off just eight 
independently because usually you would want to have noise reduction on seven audio tracks but say track eight was where you were striping your synchronization material you'd want to be able to turn off the noise reduction for that independently we'll, we'll see maybe there's a workaround from that shuttle so we hear it fast forward and speed up i mean uh, I'll need to wait until I actually use it and read the user manual to figure out exactly how this differs from pitch control. And then we've got a good, I think that's 12 segment LED bar graph going from minus 20 dB up to plus 8 dB for each of the eight tracks and toggle on off chord function. Here's the rear of the unit and we can see we've got eight individual RCA, so they must be unbalanced outputs and inputs, one for each tape track. Uh, something that I find interesting about this is the only other two rack mount units that I've worked on are Tascam 234. I only really looked at one of those ever. And I've had a couple of the... Oh, I've forgotten the name. I'll put in a clip of me saying the name of it for my teardown of that model. But anyway, both of those had at least some sort of primitive uh, line output amplifier and, you know, mixing and pre-amplification facility. Like, if you had a Task M234, you could raise dynamic microphone signals, instrument level signals up to line level and make your recording and then pan and balance those signals on playback. This machine has no such facility. You absolutely must have an external mixer in order to sum the output signals coming from tape and to well we'll look at signal levels and so on when we look at the user manual but I assume that they are expecting minus 10 decibel volts at these inputs um, so you'd need external preamplifiers at, at the very least in order to make recordings to this so truly a standalone tape machine there's just no mixer facilities in there at all up here a little level trim up for the tape sync we'll maybe look to the user manual to figure out whether that works in conjunction with any switches at the front a filter don't know what kind of filter i won't speculate we'll look at the manual later and here's your dbx noise reduction out and in switches bits per second there's a couple of jumper switches four different combinations of those two-way switches switches will give us, I think it's baud rates. Again, I'm going to check the manual because I don't really know all that much about the sync stuff because honestly, I'm not terribly interested. Um, I'm interested in terms of being a YouTube person who's sort of documenting technology that wasn't documented when it was extant because no internet. But, you know, at a personal level of me using it, I'm not that interested in it. So I'm guessing. But anyway, 9600, 4800, 2400, 1200 bits per second. Accessory two. A serial I slash F. I'm sure that's to do with this uh, synchronization jazz, but I'm a little in the dark. We'll find out later. A remote punch in and out. So presumably Tascam had their own accessory. I found that dual polarity piano sustain pedal, for instance, will work very well. We've got a remote control out. Again, we'll check in the user manual. I've got a remote control that works with, for instance, Tascam 388, Tascam 38, and things like that. So I assume the same wired remote control would work here. And that's about it for the back of the unit. So here we are in the uh, music room and I've got the 238 user manual open. I will credit that I got this from 238 Pro site. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but if anything jumps out in terms of differentiating this from other units or just stuff that people are at least somewhat familiar with multi-track cassette recorders that won't know, then I will... We'll include some of that. Unlike Tascam's Porter Studios or Mini Studios, the 238 is designed to be used with a separate mixer of your choice. Since it has no level control of its own, the 238 sync cassette must be connected to an external mixer to perform tracking, overdubbing and mix down procedures. A mixer designed for recording behaves as if there were more than one mixer in the box and consists of main and monitor sections. So really what it's saying is not only do you need a separate mixer, you really need one with at least one, uh, you know, submix, separate group, uh, auxiliary send bus so that you can keep what the talent and what the tape player hears separate. The 238 has its own built-in source slash tape switching that offers great flexibility, blah, 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 blah. I assume it just means what's coming out of the output RCA socket will change between a copy of the input socket or the output of the tape, depending on whether you arm 
the track at the front. Insert switch. Hearing source via the tape output is convenient when you're originally recording a track, but what about making an insert or punch in? I suppose like the reason I was like, oh, I wonder what insert does is that uh, a lot of the time, you know, insert describes adding effects into the gain structure. Um, like the insert sockets on a Marantz PMD740, for instance, mean that you can um, put like a compressor after the built-in preamp, but before the EQ section of that. Whereas here, they're taking insert to mean punch in, you know, the overdubbing stage of a recording. Anyway, in this case, you may need to hear the tape up until the actual punch in point called the pre-roll, then hear the new material being inserted, then switch back to tape after the punch out to see if the insert blended with the following material called a post roll. The insert button performs this function. On other recorders, this function is called input slash sync or pre-roll sync switching. If insert is on, pressing our tracks record function will not automatically switch that tracks output to source. Instead, you will get tape from that output until the master record button or the foot switch is pressed. While recording, you'll hear the source. When you punch out, you'll hear tape again. Earlier, I'd forgotten what TRT stands for. It's tape runtime. So uh, it's basically that button's changing what units are being displayed on the counter. Special tape sync circuitry makes it possible to record MIDI slash FSK sync tones or SMPTE timecode for synchronization of MIDI sequencers. External speed and transport controls are available through a serial port on the rear panel for synchronizing to other recorders or for computer control of functions. It does seem that it's using FSK frequency shift keying signals and so you would want to have an external MIDI to FSK converter such as the Tascam MTS30. It says here, turn the tape sync switch on the back of the 238 to end. This defeats the DBX encode decode for track 8 only. So it does have the facility that I was puzzled that I didn't think it had when I was first looking at it. It's just labeled a bit differently and routes the input of track 8 through the level control. Okay, so that's what that level control did. And it says turn the filter switch on the back of the 238 to N. This routes the output of a track 8 through a mid-range bandpass filter, making it virtually immune to crosstalk interference from other tracks that could cause sequencer miscuing. It's not necessary to record and playback sync tones with the 238 tape sync switch on. Many sequencers slash converters work quite well with a straight tape track. However, some units can miscue, that is, drop beats, etc., if they hear even the smallest crosstalk. Some are also very sensitive to changes in level. The tape sync switch is there as extra protection for such units. A tone recorded with tape sync on must be played back with tape sync on, otherwise the DBX decoder will change the level, causing errors. The possibility of sequencer miscuing is greatest while recording a percussive sound at high levels onto track 7 due to sync mode crosstalk. This miscuing happens only when overdubbing onto track 7, not during playback. To solve this problem, lower the recording level of track 7 and make sure that the sync tone of track 8 is recorded. If you record the sync tone at the same time as instrument tracks, processing delays in some sequencers may cause phasing or timing lags during playback. It's good practice to record the sync tone before recording instruments to tape. Computer punching. If you need insert points that are consistently repeatable within 1 30th of a second, you may want to control the 238 by an external computer device. With this method, track 8 is recorded, simply time code, and punch in out points are entered into the computer unit, which acts as a remote control for the 238 via the serial connector on the back panel. The procedure is similar to the 238's built in auto in out function, but more accurate because the computer is reading a reference actually recorded on tape instead of pulses generated by the movement of the cassette reels. Right, here's the bit about the accessory to serial I slash F connector, 15 pin D slash SUB, D sub. This is a serial in out port conforming to the RS slash 232C standard for linking the sync set to an external computer. The dip switch adjacent to the D-sub connector is used to select the bit rate as per the illustration shown below. Assume the, the necessity for it to be at 1200 BPS or 9600 BPS would come from whatever software you were using 
um, to do this very accurate form of um, punch in and punch out that was mentioned earlier in the manual. I don't know what software would have been used for that back in the day. I assume that there's going to be some sort of USB serial connector and um, some sort of facility buried within most digital audio workstations that would allow you to do that if you wanted to. I'm not interested. I mean, I probably will cover it on the channel eventually, but that sort of functionality doesn't personally float my boat as a musician. Usual business about, you know, the tape tab needs to be in if you're going to record on it. Um, you should be using type 2 tapes for good fidelity. Um, you should only use one side of the tape or it all sound backwards and uh, you're going to end up getting a quarter of the record time because you're only using one side so your C60 goes down to 30 and you're also playing at double the commercial tape speed so actually a C60 will give you 15 minutes of recording in this unit. The pitch control is plus or minus 12% so I said 10 or 15 so yeah split the difference good guess and yet 9.5 centimeters per second three and a three and a half inches per usually three and three quarters yeah, 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 I'm pretty sure that's like a typo. Should be three and three quarter inches per second. But anyway, you know, it's it's double the, the commercial tape speed of of like a Walkman or like a car stereo that you'd have in the late eighties and nineties. And you can add rack ears. I will say about rack gear, I, I'm not like a huge fan of the format. I, I like desktop stuff and I like effects that are in a pedal format. Um, I don't like sockets and switches being round the back of somewhere where I can't see them, where I've got to move furniture or get a torch or something in order to see it and access it and change it. And then I've got to buy furniture in addition to the rack unit. And then it's really importable. But I guess that way of setting things into big cabinets works for some people. Looks like we can change the voltage. So um, if you're thinking about buying one of these, you could probably buy one from the US to import it into the UK or vice versa. You'd need to change the plug on the unit. You'd need to change that little bit there, but it can be done. Some specs, direct current real motor, direct current ancillary motor, they're calling it. I've heard it called assist motor, control motor. I normally refer to it as control motor in my videos but you know that's basically the one that is raising and lowering the uh, head assembly depending which mode you're in performance characteristics hey, frequency response from 30 hertz to 16 kilohertz pretty good signal to noise ratio dbx in 90 decibels um, but only 54 with the dbx turned off so it's very specifically there that the input and output levels are expecting minus 10 decibel volts Optional equipment, RCA T8 remote control unit. Okay, so it's not quite the same one as I have. This is the RC30 punch in out remote foot switch. Like I said, you don't actually need that one. You could use something else. MTS30 MIDI tape synchronizer. Again, I've never owned one. Probably will get one at some point. I've started to look at the service manuals, a matter of course, where available before I open up a unit. Uh, the reason being that one of the more recent teardowns that I did was for an Akai MG614 and yeah I got a little bit lost and started taking the bottom panel off it which wasn't necessary and then when I got hold of the service manual it turned out that that's actually a really excellent service manual it had really good flow charts for all the calibration stuff which you know if I'd encountered that service manual earlier in my forays into learning this stuff that would have saved me some head scratching but the deconstruction instructions were really good in that manual so I could have saved myself some time by looking at that first so let's see what we've got here here we see the location of shrimp pots uh, or other adjustable uh, components playback equalizer playback reference level that's a dbx thing dbx timing Chord reference level without DBX, stock bias meter level. I'm already liking the look of this a lot better than the Tascam 234. You know, you didn't have easy access to anything. Presumably, these are the capacitors on this board here that have been replaced by a previous owner. Got real motor and what they're calling assist motor. 
that looks like that mechanism there in this part here is probably pretty similar to 488 but this is all different because like for 688, 488, 488 Mark II you would have a capstan DC motor driving a flywheel via a flat belt but this has got a direct drive motor so some stuff in this exploded view that I recognise from the 234 some that I recognise from the 488, there seems to be a bit of overlap with both of those. This is all looking much more like the 488. And then that's really all that we're told until we're onto the schematics. Which are kind of a bit too complex for me to comment on without going into these in Photoshop and co colour coding them. I'm trying to think, I mean, do I do, I do that before I get, get in and just get my hands dirty? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to reproduce the tests that the person, the eBay seller, said they already did, which is to make test recordings, discover that those test recordings are quieter on one channel. I want to reproduce those steps just in case whoever said that was an unreliable witness. So what I'm going to do now is plug a little pair of cheap powered monitors that I have in my workshop into outputs. I'll start with one and two. I believe it was, I'll need to check the original eBay list that Adrian bought from, I think it was track eight or possibly it was track seven that was quieter. We'll probably see it in the meters. And I'm going to insert this uh, TAC test tape um, MT112 and See if we can reproduce the problems that both the eBay seller and Adrian described. That is the low level on one of the tracks and we'll see if there's some instability in the capstan speed when it's first turned on. Okay, set in. Turn on the speakers. Let's uh, have a listen. Based on what Adrian was saying, um, that maybe I was going to hear it sort of ramp up to pitch. I'm not really hearing that. The nature of this tape is because it's intended for one and seven eighth inches per second, it ends up being quite a lot louder at the higher tape speed. So it is normal for me to see readings above zero dB. It's a full width tape, so the signal isn't printed into like four little channels or eight little channels on it. It's like one wide bit that's got the signal on all of it. So it does work both for this eight track and for four track machines. A little eccentricity of this particular tape, I guess. If this is the width of the tape, it was printed a little bit that way. So what I find is track eight, if I'm working with eight track, track four, if I'm working with four track, tends to be a bit quieter because I guess that signal of the tape head is just on the edge of where the signal turns into uh, you know virgin tape domains um, I'll need to turn it over and then it'll be track one will look quiet and four will look loud flip this over and see if we get slightly different uh, readings on the meters it won't sound backwards because it's just a sine wave okay yeah so one's looking quieter eight's looking louder three still pretty quiet. I was pretty sure it was seven or eight that it said in the original listing was the quiet one, but it seems like three is pretty quiet as well. And that might be a trim pot thing, but I can't uh, hear anything wrong with the capstan speed. Just out of curiosity, what happens if I... Okay. <laughs> what a ridiculous feature. Um... <laughs> Uh, an incredibly impractical thing to have. What an enormous amount of fun. Um, anyway, so yeah, that answers what that does. So I've got the top off. I will demonstrate that later on, obviously. I've just made sure that the tape sync and filter controls are out. And I've used the TIAC test tape to set the uh, playback levels using very nicely accessible and labeled trim pots along the top here. Much nicer labeling and access, everything grouped together than you see in a lot of machines. There's dropouts and fluctuations in the quality of the tape. It's a 30, 40 year old tape, but you know, most of the time, everything's sitting at about plus three dB. It's quieter at the moment, but like I said earlier, that's, I think, to do with where the 
whole width recording. I think it's slightly off on the cassette itself. If I eject this uh, and flip the tape over, you're going to see eight is pretty much a plus three and one's a bit quieter. Segment one of the head has now got the uh, quieter bit of the recording. So if anything, I can probably turn down very slightly. There we go. What I can do just now is just uh, check the sound that's coming out of input eight compared to input seven. That's eight. That's seven. Sounds the same. Use this little Fostex tone generator to uh, check that all the meters are reading at zero dB, which they are. And I've recorded those signals of all eight tracks, just as a crude way to um, test um, how the recordings are. So if I play back the results, uh, you can see that we need some fine adjustment in some of these, but eight's way down and three's way down. And that's with the respective record level trim pot pretty much maxed out. We do have two out of the eight tracks which are recording more quietly than they should. More often than not, if I replace in particular the signal path electrolytic capacitors, then that will resolve the issue and we'll get a much louder signal out of those. So not too much work there. I'll just show you how the upper case was removed. And this is how I'm organizing things when I'm taking apart a machine, especially an unfamiliar one now. I've got a bunch of these uh, small sealable plastic bags of the type that you would use to keep a loved one's ashes inside your bra or cocaine um, hidden uh, between your ass cheeks on the way into a nightclub. And so I just use them to kind of divide up the screws and then I use masking tape as a painter and decorator would use to stick them inside close to the holes where they go. This doesn't really leave a residue anyway, but even if it did, it's not on the outer cosmetic surface. So there were one, two, three, four holes that correspond to two, which are on this end and another two on this end. And then this one like this fixes onto the back here. Here we are looking down on the unit. You can see that I've wrapped insulating tape all around the power switch where the power inlet joins to the transformer on the primary side. This is to prevent me from absent-mindedly electrocuting myself. Even if the unit were plugged in and the power switch were turned on, the likelihood of me getting an electric shock from any of these areas here is extremely low. It's much more likely that uh, static from my body would do damage to some of the more sensitive integrated circuits. But uh, this area here is a potentially lethal place to touch so I tend to make sure that the unit is unplugged and then cover up anywhere I might touch live and neutral wires absent-mindedly later in the process. So nice layout here, plenty of space around the transformer to let heat out, transport block, pretty accessible considering it's one of these ones with a jack door in the front. All our recording playback boards are on separate daughter boards and they and this power conditioning board I uh, looks like they're all connected to this motherboard and down in the bottom control logic seems to be in a board that's on the back of meters and the LCD panel and so on here um, I'll begin by removing this metal cover and uh, then we'll try and figure out what else we need to do to get these boards out and I'll separate the ones that were performing well from those which need some calibration so that's the style of screws. The brass with a double head came from locations here and just off to the right there. That was fit in like that. There's this little foam separator between the surface and the back of this board here that had actually come off. Um, the glue was old and dry so I've just put a little bit of carpet to floor tape on the back there so that will stay there. So you can see that each of these boards is connected here. Uh, the colouring scheme, probably what I'm going to do is uh, write it on this m metal board here. You can see that from left to right, we've got four connectors with black trim. That's brown, red, orange, yellow. And then the next four over have red trim at the end with the main cable again being brown, red, orange, and yellow. So I will make a note of that on that piece of metal. I believe these are the arrays and record head connections. I'm not sure exactly which is which, but we have a white one and a black one. And uh, you can see the in the black 
shielding here that I'm tapping with the screwdriver, that's probably the shield interference and such like. And then you've your white and red are your uh, the two sides of your electrical connection so that you're getting a complete circuit. Anyway, I've removed all of them except this one, that head screwdriver between the two plastic parts, the header and the connector. I don't want to pull on the wires themselves because they're quite thin. Now, this is free, so you can see the solution I've gone for is with black and with red sharpies, B R O Y stands for brown, red, orange, yellow, brown, red, orange, yellow, and then I'll know because of the colour. Black ones are the ones with the black wrap around them, and red letters are the ones with the red wrap around them. Uh, put SC to remind myself that a screw goes there, and um, I've got the screw masking tape to the bit of metal and my little cocaine bag there. If I were to unplug all of these, that would easily come out from under there. I'll leave it there for now. Move on to figuring out how this plate here, which is preventing these boards from lifting out, comes out. I'm pretty sure that's going to be two anodized black screws in the back here. So with these two little black screws, I'm going to narrow a thread, metal into metal screws, removed from two locations on the back panel here, where I'm tapping on my thumb. And here where I'm tapping with my thumb, this will just lift out. I've already removed seven of the boards, being careful to keep the problem ones separate so I know which ones I'm recapping. These are just going into a pair of connectors down here in the motherboard. So I'm just tipping it that way first because these headers are shorter and then tipping it up the way. If necessary, just pushing against the motherboard there. And left out like that. I think what I will work towards next is getting the cassette player out. It looks like it's screwed by these side brackets at the bottom but also at the top. Um, so there's this metal plate that's going right along the length and there's a screw at this end, two above the cassette player and one more at this end. So I'll remove that bracket and see where we are. So with those four screws removed this is going to lift out. Notice for the purpose of reassembly we have three little hooks that are going into plastic tabs along there but this metal tab should go behind this board to prevent it bashing against whatever is behind there. Wiring from the cassette player is all grouped together with wiring that seems to be running from this power board to this control board. So to make sure that I can lift out this metal part with the terminals for the heads and the transport in one unit because I want to be able to clean the heads properly, remove the pinch roller and clean it. I'm going to need to detach these two clumps of wire so where possible cable ties provided by the manufacturer I will leave alone but usually in the process of taking one of these things apart I will need to cut some of them. Overall it's a very clean build this though so I'm just being careful to get the sharp tip of this pair of scissors underneath the cable tie but not cut any of the wires obviously. So it looks like I'm going to have to cut this one as well because this pair is going off to the cassette player as well. And there's a pair here. Cable ties I'm just going to cut. Now these are all clumped in together as well and this one so yeah I'm really going to have to cut all of these. Cut that. These ones here I would probably replace just because they're close enough to moving parts that could cause a problem. So now what I'm going to do, just to help me remember where things go when I put them back, is I'm going to colour code the headers and connectors uh, with different colours of Sharpie. So before I pull out this little one here, both one side of the connector and the header is going to be coloured with green. Cables are fairly thick so I feel safe to just pull on those. I mean it's quite possible to go back to the wiring diagram for these and figure it out but that's a bit of a headache. I need to figure out exactly what's happening with the cassette door, whether there's anything I need to remove from that other side. Uh, so I got a bit confused during the removal of that. I'll just talk to you through a couple of the steps. So there are two screws in this bottom bracket and they are going into holes here and here in this uh, lower part of the case. This won't want to come through without you removing this part. What you do is with the door ejected, that would just slide up. In the process of trying to get that out, I made a few missteps where I've started to take this off. We'll come back to that later. I'll uh, look at the cassette player next. I am at the reassembly stage. 
I just want to make it clear that two little screws in here, I'm sorry the contrast is bad, but there's two small ones in here, clamp between this part here and the cassette player. So they do need to be loosened and removed if you need to remove the cassette player. So we'll look at this side first. There's a problem that's been quite well documented by this guy, Dennis Petrov, who's got 238.com site, and uh, he's recently started uploading stuff on YouTube as well. There's uh, five capacitors and a uh, Zener diode that need to be replaced on here if you start to have problems with the capstan motor. This one here, direct drive motor. I didn't notice any problems with it, and you can see that those capacitors have been replaced. They would normally be surface mount, and you can see that someone's put in capacitors that you'd use on a through hole circuit board. So I'm not concerned with that. Real motors, just a basic 12 volt motor, so that won't ever really go wrong, or at least not in my experience. Um, I suppose occasionally you'd get like an armature or commutator or something on there, but. There was no problems with fast forward or rewind there. And this is the assist or control or what, what, what I forget what they were calling up. They're calling it something else in this schematic. But basically that motor's gonna drive some cogs, which is gonna drive an arm, which is going to raise and lower this head assembly and the pinch roller, depending on uh, which mode you're in. And usually there are clips to allow us to take these plates out. There might be screws on this one by the looks, but I'll take that out in a minute so we can see exactly how the real motor is driving the take up and supply reels. Heads look to be the same parts as uh, 688, 488 and so on. Pinch roller here, I mean, doesn't look awful, but there's a little bit of discoloration, maybe some ground in residue. I'll clean that at least. I'm not going to completely take this apart. Is, is there a spring or is it a vacuum? One or the other. I'm not sure what that would contain, but anyway, that's making a slower cushioned movement on this side and uh, that's the catch on that side. Um, it's the button uh, on the front of the case is just a, a long bit of plastic with a spring to, that's hitting that plate. So these two very small screws remove from here and here. And then we can lift this up and out. Um, these little indented parts slot into recesses on these uh, black plastic pegs and that's going to hold back like that because there's a backlit light for the cassette cavity. These are optical sensors for the rotation of these rails. By putting the screwdriver into these recesses I've removed two long screws like that and that has detached the real motor and you can see that its spindle is driving via this cog a little idler tire. It's not too bad, I will condition it. What I'm doing at the moment is I've got a little tub of MG Chemicals Rubber Renew and so I'm just submerging the tires, pinch rollers in that for a couple of minutes and then giving it a good rub down and that gets uh, a lot of the debris or any kind of slightly out of condition rubber on the surface off there. So I'll just remove those parts now. And there's a little plastic retainer clip here. So I can lift up one end of that with these tweezers. It takes a bit of patience and you need to be careful it doesn't flick away. Uh, these little things, I can't find a, a source for them. If anyone knows of one, let me know in the comments. So you can see there's the little idler wheel. Just so I don't damage that tire, I'll probably submerge the entire plastic wheel in here as well. It won't do any harm. So that's just got a small amount from a larger bottle of MG Chemicals Rubber Renew. And that's it for a minute while I take this uh, pinch roller assembly off. I'm trying to get this at an angle where you can see what I'm doing. So this came from a like, pack of desoldering tools, but I find that this little bit is good for getting into these C-clips and getting them out. And that's come off. And uh, the other end of that spring was just clipped onto where I'm touching with my fingernail there. I usually find it by pinch back and forth a couple of times with a pair of pliers on this pin. And at a certain point after going back and forth, you're gonna be able to push it through from the back. And now it means you'll be able to grip it from the front and pull it out and then the entire pinch roller will come out so that you know it's not 
terrible but there's like a bit of residue on the surface there so I'll clean that as well. see a certain amount of black residue come off this now so that potion will remove a very thin layer of the rubber and sort of age proof the rubber beneath so getting any dirt that's on there in the process so we're just future proofing this little bit of rubber get any dirt off the sides of it as well Okay, so that's looking a lot clearer now. So if you needed to get hold of one of those, the inner diameter of that tire is six millimeters, the outer diameter is 10 millimeters, and the width of it is two millimeters. If you needed to replace the pinch roller, then the diameter of the hole in the middle is one millimeter, the outer diameter, that is between my thumb and forefinger now, that is 13 millimetres. The width of the plastic part in the centre, I'm calling that the core, that's 9 millimetres, whereas the width of the rubber itself is 6 millimetres. Those are the only two rubber parts on there. I'll uh, clean those heads with isopropyl and um, demagnetise them. Nothing else to be done with this really. Um, it looks pretty clean. Now, I already had enough access for all the repairs I need to do to this unit, but although I won't take apart absolutely everything, I will go as far as to get access to tactile switches under here, because they're things that I do have to replace fairly commonly. So I already got this from plate separate from here uh, while I was misunderstanding how to remove that cassette player. I'll just uh, show you what's been removed from there. So we've got three knobs here. Two for the tape speed and the uh, pitch control are identical and then you've got a sort of stubbier one that was on the uh, shuttle control. Each end of this has two holes where screws are going to go through this plastic part into the chassis. These are the four screws, the threads are close together and at quite a close to horizontal angle since they're going into metal. In addition to that, underneath, in two places, here and here, we have screws like this. You can see the thread is much less dense on these and the angle is uh, steeper. This central position though here had another kind of screw and it's the same sort of thread as the ones on the side but it's uh, longer and it's got a domed cap on it. Seven screws in total and that'll come out. There are also these much narrower screws which require a smaller screwdriver and uh, those fit in here and uh, allow you to tip this forward and out because then we're going to get access to tactile switches in there um, so it looks like there's shielding here with three screws can't imagine there's much more than the tactile switches and the leds in there um, these are working fine so i'll probably leave that intact i will however disconnect this and see if we can get this board away from here so i'm going to want to unplug anything that's connected from this power conditioning board here to this control board or from the motherboard to the control board. Looks like we're going to need to do a bit more snipping of cable ties. Do some colour coding here. This cable here I'm not going to bother to colour because there aren't very many red plastic headers. I think that's going to be obvious enough on this uh, tape sync and DBX noise reduction switchboard. The connector is black but the header is not so I'll colour the connector black to make it a bit more obvious that that's where that's going back. Alright so that front panel is separate now we can start looking at it by itself. So it looks like this yellow plastic header is connecting this part so we could then detach that all together. I can see five different sets of cables going from this board that seems to have the main microcontroller on it to boards that presumably don't contain much more than the tactile switches and the LED meters. 
leave some sort of colour coded shell for myself for when I unplug these. And just three screws and then that board in place. And they're going into plastic so the threads are wider apart at a more steep angle. Okay, so we've got two sets of wires that are still connecting these two boards. So if I get one, two, three, four, five screws out, then presumably that's going to lift out. Uh, there's a sixth one in the corner here that I didn't count before. There's two clips here, one above and one below, holding that in place. So if I pry those open... There's a few little capacitors here and the chips that are interpreting, interpreting? Interpreting uh, the signals and sending off the LEDs, I guess. But most of the thinking, if you like, must be on this half of that pair of boards. But occasionally you would have to replace the switches like this. Pitch daughter board is connected to this front fascia via two screws there, but to be honest, I don't think that would be necessary if you needed to recap that or resolder anything. You could just get at it from there. So far as the tear down goes, this is what we're left with. And we're at a point here where anything else you needed to access for the sake of soldering in new components, then it's pretty obvious how these things are removed. There are visibly obvious screws that you would unscrew. Any cables that I have yet to unplug, you've seen what my process are. Do some color coding as I go along. I'll just comment a little bit on what is still here. This is the joining place for the record and playback signals, uh, the RCA sockets are mounted to it. We have our 85 kilohertz AC bias oscillator here. This looks like a 8 pin op amp chip. This is the filter and attenuation I would assume for the track 8 for synchronization. I would need to look at the schematic to know exactly what that is but we've got a 40 pin chip here so that's something microcontrollery. It's not as big as the chip that's on the control board but it probably is doing something master planish. Here's our power conditioning board and we've got all the big high capacity capacitors for filtering out the AC slow blow fuses couple of rectifiers, different uh, voltages for motors, op amps, logic stuff. Probably could be at least three varieties of direct current voltage regulators are underneath a little heat sink and sandwiched between these two metal plates under here. I'm just got this big <laughs> lever going to a power switch that's situated back here. Uh, there's a to Mister there and primary site and then secondary site of the transformer. And it looks like we've got separate daughter boards for mounting of you know external peripherals, remote control, punch in out, and a separate little board for all these switches. If you needed to detach that and solder anything there, then these sorts of standoffs you just pinch them with the. Uh, pliers and then that would slot off. That's enough reconnaissance so if you had to do different sorts of repairs to the ones I'm going to have to do on this unit then you'd at least know how to take it apart. So I've gone on to the schematic and identified the capacitors that are part of the audio signal path in recording mode. I've colour coded the ones I'm going to replace. There are different colours of Sharpie at the top depending on the values. So we have this uh, 2.2 microfarad one that's uh, going into the DBX. Prior to the DBX there's a op-amp stage here and there's three 10 microfarad capacitors associated with those and then the post op-amp stage. There's one 10 microfarad one and then this one is also 10 microfarad but it's bipolar. I don't actually have a replacement bipolar one so these ones I'm just going to take out of circuit and test to make sure that they're okay, the equivalent series resistance isn't too high etc. And finally as a precaution there are these 100 microfarad capacitors. Those are from the plus and minus 12 volt supplies for the operational amplifiers respectively. And although both these boards are playing back correctly and that would indicate that the power rails are fine, otherwise the op-amp for playback, which I assume must be these ones, uh, wouldn't be working properly. As a precaution I will just uh, replace those as well.
Okay, I've uh, reassembled the unit, well, more or less. I've still got the case to put back on the top, but I've double-checked the meter and the playback calibration and redone the record calibration, and I've now got all eight of the tracks uh, responding within 1 dB. So some of them are just about minus 1, and some of them are exactly at 0 in response to a, a 0 dB input signal. So uh, that's within the tolerances described in the service manual. So I would say that the recapping has worked. I hope you found this interesting and helpful. If you've got any questions, let me know in the comment section. If you are within posting distance of the UK, you can send your unit to me for servicing or repair. There's service manuals for free up on my website. Liking, sharing, commenting, all these things help me to get this information in front of as many people as possible. So please consider doing that. Thanks for watching to the end. Hope to see you again soon.